The Radioactive Orchestra is about making a musical connection to the world of atoms. We use scientific data and measurements of gamma radiation to create music, and we have been doing this in a couple of ways before. We have made a recording, like a record, uh, on vinyl, and uh, we have made some software as well. Uh, but today I'm going to show you something new and something uh, different that we haven't done before, and that is our first live musical instrument. So I'm going to demo our first prototype of our first live musical instrument using radiation, or gamma radiation. But first I'm going to talk a little bit about physics, so bear with me. Gamma radiation is actually the same kind of radiation as just normal light, it's photons. But the photons have a much higher energy and a much shorter wavelength, so we can't see them with our own eyes. And they come from the core of atoms, like from the nuclei of atoms. And they are released when the atom falls apart a little bit, when it decays. And this happens all around us, all the time. Even in our own bodies, there are four to 5,000 decays every second. And this lets us know things about the very, very small. Uh, and listening to gamma radi radiation or measuring gamma radiation is actually a little bit like hearing an echo of something happening inside of an atom or inside of the core of an atom. And it's so small. I mean, you might think that an atom itself is small, but consider that the nuclei of an atom, if the atom was the size of a big stadium, like Globen, the nuclei of an atom would be the size of a grain of couscous inside of that. And we can know things about the inside of this grain of couscous just by measuring the radiation that comes out of it. Um, and to me, as an artist, I'm just extremely baffled and fascinated by this, and that there is this whole aspect to reality that is I mean, it's just as real as the things that I can hear and smell and touch. I know it's there, but it's completely inaccessible to me. Uh, I mean, there must be some kind of experience in there or out there or whatever you say, that I, something that I can't experience. Maybe some kind of beauty or some kind of ugliness or something. And this m really makes me want to find some kind of way to, to visualize it or do something with it, maybe play with it. Uh, and also the fact that it's there and that it's inaccessible to us, it sort of makes it a bit scary, of course, but to me also it makes it magical, this thing that's there all the time. Um, scientists, though, uh, in my experience, they are generally not so fond of the word magic when it comes to describing what they work with. Um, I mean, they are about understanding things and I guess yeah, of course, the goal of science is to understand things. Uh, so that's what they do, uh, I guess. But still, when we talk to them, and we've been extremely lucky in this project to have access to uh, different physicists, uh, very good ones as well. And when I talk to them and when I you know, read stuff online or, or listen to talks about it, I sense that there is something else there except this quest for knowledge and understanding. These scientists, they have, they have feelings for this stuff, you know. Uh, they have isotopes that are dear to their hearts, <laughs> for real. And they, I mean, they get slightly embarrassed if, the, if it's the wrong kind of noise in a graph, and I think they probably dream about decaying nuclei. I, no one has said they do, but I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, and they show us these, these graphs and these papers of like hundreds of plotted data points and with a smile on their face, like, look at this awesome thing. Uh, so, and I mean, all this, the, the most of what they say is millisieverts this and kilo electrons that and Poisson distribution and a lot of mathematical formulas. And in reality, that's probably the, the real, only real gateway. This dry language and this mathematics is probably the only, only real gateway into this extraordinary aspect of reality. But, uh, I mean, for me, and I think for many others, it's, uh, it's not really an option to, to really, really learn nuclear physics. Um, but still, I, I can't keep my fingers off it. It's something there that I have to fiddle with. And just because I don't understand all of it, it doesn't stop me from 
building my own worlds using their data and using their fantastic toys that they have, <laughs> their <laughs> amazing measurement equipment. Um, and to me, this is what Radioactive Orchestra is all about, this building worlds. Uh, it's sort of like being a landscape painter, in a way, but someone that has no idea what a tree is, or a river, or a stone, or anything. Uh, I mean, someone might have told me about the, the, the ground and the sky, but that's it. I, I don't know more, but still I can, I can do something with it. I can, I can use this data and information, and uh, that's what really uh, intrigues me about working with this, that it has a connection to a reality that I can't see. But, I mean, why would the scientists want to work with us? <laughs> uh, why would they want to engage themselves in such silly activities that we are doing? I mean, it's not science at all. So, uh, to get some kind of answer to that question, I brought one. Uh, welcome, Tim Lundström. <laughs> it's one of the scientists that have been helping us during this project. Thank you, Christopher. Mm. Thank you all. Well, apparently, I'm one of those who dream about decay nuclei, well, maybe not so often, and um, have isotopes that are dear to my heart, and I must admit, I do. <laughs> so, the topic of this TEDx event is Beyond Borders, and the first thing I would want to ask is, is there a border between science and art? I mean, there are some people who think that we should reduce the number of, pe of uh, students that stu study aesthetic uh, subjects due to the preconceived idea that it's unproductive. Well, I disagree. I think that science and art are mutually independent on, on the, each other. I mean, scientists need the artist to interpret the results, to bring an understanding to the theories, and to, do, to inspire to new discoveries. Um, I don't know about you, but what do you remember from uh, the school about stuff? <laughs> Radiation? <laughs> well, maybe not so much. Uh, one thing that I learned when I speak to a lot of scientists is that if you want to know what they've been inspired by, they usually say, for example, science fiction literature. That's an art. So art is very important, and scientists often use art when they try to describe what they are doing or what the theory is about. One example is the string theory. Do you know the string theory? It's, that, it's a theory that says that the whole universe is made up by vibrating strings of membranes. Does it sound like, it's, uh, like an instrument? Well, why is it in interesting for me as a scientist to uh, work on something like the radioactive orchestra? I think, to me, the radioactive orchestra is a way of using music to bring an understanding for something that is invisible, it's tasteless, it's odorless, and thus, like Christopher said, a little bit frightening, ionizing radiation. Uh, when we uh, started this uh, project, we thought, well, what should it be all about? And I think that one thing that the radioactive orchestra is really about is to inspire, to have fun with something. Something bring sound to the, to the world, do something fun. And at the same time, we are bringing an understanding for physics, for radiation, for uh, isotopes. I hope this will inspire, especially young people, to explore more about physics. And maybe they end up in a career, a scientific career, or a musical career. And I believe that if they do that, 
the world had become a little bit richer and a little bit better place for us all to live in. We will now demonstrate our new uh, demo. It's a prototype of an instrument. Imagine this room is full of radiation, ionizing radiation, radioactivity. It comes from the stone in the walls. It comes from the ground beneath our feet. It comes from the universe. And it comes from within our own bodies. Christophe will use this radiation to create sound so we all can experience this invisible world. Please. Mm. OK. So just to get the, the, the thing here, this is, this is a detector. Uh, when it gets hit by a photon, and yes, it detects single photons, actually. Uh, when it gets hit by a photon, it detects the energy of that photon and immediately sends it to the computer. And if the energy of the photon is high, it plays a high note. And if the energy of the photon is low, it plays a deep note. So, and this is what that sounds like. And to show you that I'm not that I'm not faking this, I, I have some uranium here that I can bring close to this one and Yeah. But you know, there's th this is this is good and all. But I mean, the scientists when they look at their data, they don't look at all at once. They can look at a section of it, and I mean, we can do that as well. So we can look at like the, like the lower section of what's coming in. Like, just look at the photons with the low energy, or we can like move up a little bit and look at the mid section, and maybe just. The higher ones. And, and by doing that, I can create different filters. Uh, so basically different ways of looking at what's coming in. Uh, and I, I mean, I can also look at it all again, but I mean, I can also transpose it. I don't have to have this. Because now uh, I have sort of the range of this one is mapped directly to the range of our hearing, but I can I can make another mapping. So I can of course map it differently. And in a way, this is this is not the sound of radiation, by the way. Radiation doesn't sound anything. So this is actually a piano that radiation can play rather. But the problem with this piano right now, or um, not the problem, but uh, the thing with this piano is that it has infinite number of keys and I mean that's not usually how I make music I do that sometimes but but uh, I usually have like okay I can play these keys and I, I don't have like 10 keys between the E and F uh, so I can just I can tell it okay you're only allowed to play a piano and you're only allowed to play in this key so I can tell it to do that so. Then it sounds a bit different. Hmm. <laughs> and I mean, I can also. I have some more radioactive stuff here. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Chalmers, by the way, for providing us uh, with this in a safe way. Uh, we're not allowed to have this uh, unless they were here. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we wouldn't want to unless we had someone who knew what they were doing. <coughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I have I have a patch here, or I have a set of filters. And and the thing about filters, uh, when you're filtering someone, is like you're removing some information so that other information appears more clearly. And that is, uh, I mean, that's something you do in, in 
science and in music and in, in many other ways. I mean, it's uh, also like a mental device or something. And since the receiving end from the, for this data is, is uh, our sense of musicality and our hearing, uh, I'm trying to design the filters in a way that it should be pleasant to us to listen to. Uh, so I've tried to design a filter here that can try to make you detect between uh, europium 152 and, and cesium. Here I have some cesium 137. Um, <laughs> see which this one is. Yeah, I think it's this one here and this one here. Where is it? It's rather this one. Let's see. So that was europium, 152, and this is cesium. And you will know. I, I don't want to tell you what to what to listen to, but. Can you hear it? It's this actually this tone that's much more distinctive. This is, this is my uranium harp. <laughs> the funny thing about this uranium harp is that the strings, every time I, every time I stroke it, the strings will appear in different places at random, no, at random places. So it's impossible to know exactly where the strings are. It's like in different places every time. OK. I think that was all. Thank you. Thank you.